welcome everyone to the second webinar in the Earth Odyssey series. Uh, for those that don't know, Earth Odyssey was co-founded by Yuri Sanada and Mahendra Shah, both of whom are on the call today. Um, and we'll hear, be hearing about them a bit later on. But the mission of Earth Odyssey, just a reminder, because uh, I'm sure you have all have been to the website earthodyssey.org. Um, but the mission of Earth Odyssey is to empower the educators of children to essentially be better leaders for the future. And there's a number of things that we can do on that. So I urge everyone, please go to earthodyssey.org to read a bit more about what we're doing there. Uh, today's session, as I said, it's the second um, in what we hope is a, is a long line of series of webinars. Today's is focused on save oceans, save ourselves. Um, water is life itself. It, it gives birth to everything and everything living needs the water to sustain itself. It once covered the whole planet and if we're not careful, it will take it back. Tomorrow is World Oceans Day. In fact, I believe every day should be World Oceans Day because we should be honoring the most precious resource that we have on this blue planet water on a daily basis. One of the experts that we have today speaking is Yuri Sanada. He spent, and he knows the ocean very well, having spent five months on a Phoenician boat um, on a wonderful expedition. I'm going to go straight to Yuri now so that he can show you what that expedition was about and what the importance of water, obviously, to that expedition was. Yuri, over to you. Good morning from Brazil. Uh, here for me now is 9 o'clock. I know for you guys all different time zones. Yeah, I'm just going to talk about uh, the oceans, the way I experience it. I'm a dive instructor. I've been working with the ocean for the past, I don't know, 30, 40 years uh, since I was, was little. And I just made a, a nice expedition. We just crossed the ocean going from Tunisia, North of Africa, all the way to Florida, Miami, in a 3,000 years old uh, replica of a Phoenician ship. So this is a project we made last year. We started in September and finished this year in February. And we basically, we built a replica of Phoenician ship. A Phoenicians, they were the ancient navigators, the best navigators of all times. So what we intend to do is to learn what the ancient people did, how they did, how they navigate, how they use the sea, how they use the oceans, and how they, of course, had to be very intimate with the oceans so they kept it safe as well, uh, better than us, better than that's what we are doing now, I think. So just to, very briefly, Phoenicians are the ancient people that lived in Lebanon and Syria, and from there, like I said, 3,000 years ago, they sail all over the Mediterranean, they sail around Africa, and maybe even reached the Americas long before Christoph Columbus or Cabral came to Brazil. So some 2,000 years before then. So that's what I intend to prove, that it was possible. Not that they did, because we don't have evidence, but that it was possible. So we built a ship. And of course, for that, we had to do a lot of research. I, I wrote two books about the subject, how the ancient people might have come to the Americas, uh, to Brazil or, or to USA or Mexico or Caribbean, long before the, the Portuguese and the Spanish uh, did. So some of my books. Now, this is Captain Philip Bill. He's the guy who invented this expedition. He put this thing together. And I was his partner doing the, the documentary. That's what we do. We do documentaries, we do movies. And we got together and planned this expedition. Uh, actually, we made two. So very briefly, we built this ship based on two shipwrecks from the south of France, from a place called Jules Verne. Uh, it's in the Museum of Marseille. But uh, with, from those uh, shipwrecks, we, we built the ship in, in Syria in 2008. And it's a very difficult way, of course, traditional way to, to build ships. But it floated. It was very nice. Uh, we managed to make the first expedition. And the first ex expedition was circumnavigated Africa as reported by uh, the father of history, Herodotus. He wrote that Phoenicians did that long before the Portuguese. So with this ship, the Hepka ship, we got an international crew. We had, I don't know, I think 50 people came to the expedition, different legs, volunteers. And uh, most of the time we had like uh, 12 people, uh, maybe aboard, but uh, people changed uh, from, from place to place. Anyway, you need at least eight people, strong people to raise the, that uh, sail, that 
it weighs uh, about a ton. And this is my wife Vera. She's uh, she's steering the, the ship using this traditional rudder. Uh, we, we didn't have a central rudder. Those uh, ancient ships had two uh, to 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 rudder one on each side, more like oars. And this is the toilet we had aboard. Uh, being a traditional ship, it didn't have a modern you know uh, comforts of uh, a modern sail sailboat. We had this old style uh, toilet that used for you know everything you had to do plus the showers. <laughs> and of course, crossing the ocean, and we took it, it took us two years to do this whole single navigation of Africa. So we set sail from Syria 2008 and end back in Syria in 2010, just before the civil war started. But uh, we had some rough seas. This is going on the south of Africa, uh, the Cape of Good Hope. When you crossed, we had some very big, big waves there. Uh, that's me and I'm a calm day. There's no wind, you can see the sail, there's no wind there. So I, I could get out of the ship and do some uh, filming for the documentary we made. And of course, uh, we had to pay attention, close attention to the ocean because when you navigate like that, especially in an old ship like that, you have to be aware of the weather, of the sea conditions because you know, everything's against you actually. So even when we go out for swimming, when the ship was become, we have to go swimming, we have to look out for, for sharks. And that's uh, usually when people will stay aboard the ship and look at the horizon, when they see the first shark, shark, uh, shark's tip, it's time to everybody to get out of the water, come back to, to the boat. Of course, we didn't eat any shark. We, we didn't hunt for them. We, we did some fishing for, you know, uh, to food, source of uh, protein on board, but we never ate the, the sharks. If we, we got them on the, our rod, we just throw them back to the, to the water because they are, most of them are endangered species. And this is nice. This is uh, Philip dressed as a Captain, Captain Phillips dressed as like a Neptune. So every time you cross the equator line under sail, people who never did that before, they have to, you know, be baptized. That, that, that's what they did. Uh, by the way, that's a, a friend from, from Sweden as well. And after two years sailing around Africa, we did arrive to uh, Syria again, Lebanon, Syria. And we had, of course, a very nice reception. reception. Every port we stopped along the way in, in Lebanon, most of the ports, we, we stayed in the main ports there. And also in Syria, in uh, this small island, Arawat. So this was a very nice project. And we did prove that Phoenicians, 3,000 years ago, they knew what they were doing. They knew about the oceans and they could, you know, uh, they managed to, to sail maybe to, to Americas. And that's the thing that we did in the Sackless expedition that we just made, uh, just finished in February. We, we decided to go across the Atlantic, okay, um, to see if the Phoenicians had the capability in that old ship to come to the Americas, uh, 2,000 years before the, the Europeans. And this is their ship uh, and a drone shot in the middle of the Atlantic. And we started in Carthage in Tunisia. It's an uh, old Phoenician settlement. Uh, the, the biggest one they had in North of Africa. And these are people from Club du Don, a local a historical group that helped us a lot there. And that's our ship on the background, the big sail to the left. And of course, we set sail from there on September last year and sailed towards this, the, you know, the sun, sunset. We had to make a stop in uh, Algeria for some repairs just two days after we left, left Tunisia, which was very nice. And they're just going fast, this Cadiz in Spain. Cadiz, of course, the main port of the Spanish left used to leave from to go to Americas in the old days, in 1500s. So that's a, a, a historical stop we made. Uh, Esawira in Morocco, also a Phoenician port. Esawira is out of the Mediterranean, it's in the Atlantic. And the Phoenicians, like, like I said, 3,000 years ago, they used to go there. And from there, they had a small island called Bogador. And from that island, they get iron and they export iron all over the Mediterranean and um, some places in Africa as well. And we're talking 3,000 years ago, that's how long, or even before that, we have been using the oceans. Uh, here's some children come to the, to the ship to visit to know about their history, some history. Uh, made a stop in Tenerife, Tor Her Herdals Museum, which is a very nice place to you know, know about the legends of who used the oceans before us. Before it set sail, here's Didrik uh, for Norway on the toilet. And of course, uh, the best way to have a shower, not a bucket, but going to the water. And sometimes you even meet some uh, very nice animals in the water. Of course, this is their habitat. And this is a pack of, uh, of uh, pilot whales. I think there was like 15 of them, one of the stops we, we made. And this one, he turned and looked at me in my eyes and stayed like for 30 seconds with me, uh, just looking what a strange animal I was. And I tried to explain, I'm human, I'm from land, but just visiting to you, I'm not, I don't mean any harm. And uh, this is something nice we did. We made an agreement with UN Environment 
and they have a Green Seas campaign. It's basically about the plastic in the ocean. And we take measurements. Every day, we used to have uh, one of a small bottle and get sample of the water to measure the micro particles of plastic in the water. So we had 70 samples from this five month trip from Tunisia, North of Africa, all the way to, to Miami. And we, we are going to be uh, analyzing that now and releasing the data. So how much microplastic we, we found in the water on the, on the surface of, of the water all the way across the, the, the Atlantic. And after 39 days, we arrived in Santo Domingo in Dominican Republic. It was a very, very nice place to, uh, to arrive. And that's the Caribbean. So we made it. We proved that the Phoenicians had the capability to cross the Atlantic 3,000 years ago. And Florida, of course, a very nice reception with the firefighters making a, a, a rainbow for us, just a private rainbow. Part of the crew who got to America from, I think it was 20 different countries, people came for this expedition. And this is in front of uh, Yacht Club in Fort Lauderdale. Okay, so just a brief introduction of what I do. I do this as expeditions. We do uh, documentaries about the ocean, about the nature, uh, Amazon and stuff. And just to talk briefly, just to summarize, we have a big problem today in the oceans, of course, as everybody's aware of that. We have global warming. We have sea levels rising. We have right temperatures because of that, killing animals. And most of the pollution comes from the, from the, from the land, 80% of that. And we, we see, we have some, we, we, we see that in the ocean. We have some uh, big garbage patches. There's five, one in the ancient Indian Ocean, two in the Atlantic, and two in the Pacific. And only 1% of what, what we see, and we see a lot, there's a lot of plastic floating in this place where they, you know, there's a, a, a place where the, all the plastic gather together and make this big, huge uh, island of, uh, of garbage. But only 1% is afloat. 99% is in the bottom of the ocean. So that's very bad. Of course, we are very aggressive, especially from Brazil and Australia is the same. We have uh, pesticides and nutrients used for, you know, for the crops that goes into the ocean and causes a big problem as well. Um, plus, before, besides of that, we have industrial plants discharging sewage out in the water, in the rivers, and it goes to the water. So oil spills and everything else. So it's, it's very bad. We're doing a lot of uh, damage to the oceans. We don't realize because it's there. We, don't, we think it's uh, something that we don't have to take care of, of. But of course, it's getting back to us. The, like the mic microplastic of, uh, mic particles of plastic we, we've, we throw in the ocean, the fish eat that, we eat the fish, so we're eating that as well. It's getting to us. So that's very bad. Of course, we have some uh, ways to, to make it uh, less damage uh, to the environment and to us. Of course, if you use uh, plastic, not only once, like use the plastic throw away. No, if you have plastic or, or glass, even better, and you, you don't use that uh, only once, you reduce the plastic in the water uh, to create more marine parks and to help to have less destructive uh, fishing methods. So by the, Know about the fish you eat and how it uh, got to your, to your plate and avoid the fish that is really destroying the environment. That's some, some, some nice things you can do. And of course, the best thing you, have to, you can do now is to educate yourself. You learn about the ocean, learn how we have impact on the ocean, and then uh, you can do something about that. And that's about it I had to say. Thank you very much for, for that, for the attention. Thank you so much, Yuri. That was fascinating. And I'm pretty sure they uh, traveled to the Americas before Christopher Columbus, so he wasn't actually the first. Um, I think we'd all be interested on this platform to uh, share knowledge on the pr plastic uh, when you get those analyses, so we can come back to that at a later date. Now we turn to a video, a short video.
So that's our beautiful blue planet. Uh, not only does water, of course, nourish us physically, but it also nourishes us spiritually. And on that note, I want to bring in Mahendra Shah, co-founder of Earth Odyssey and founder of Zen Resort Bali. Um, and Zen, he'll talk, he'll talk to you a bit about how we use water at Zen Resort Bali to nourish the spiritual um, as well as the physical. Over to you. A human being is more than 70% water. Some 80% of the surface of the earth is water. We spend the first nine months of our life in water. Water is the greatest healer there is. At the same time, modern lifestyles, we are creating unprecedented amount of garbage. And most of this garbage ends up in the seas and the oceans and the rivers and the lakes. So we have two issues in the 21st century, human health and environmental pollution. By the age of less than one year, we have become shallow breathers. We are only using 60% of our lungs. So we have to learn to breathe for our health. Secondly, meditative focus, to know how to meditate is extremely important because that will keep stress away. So meditation is equally important. And gentle exercise is necessary in combination with the food we eat. So where do you go to learn? We would like to find a place where you can unconsciously start to breathe correctly and start to meditate without even understanding what is meditation and do gentle exercise. We have uh, developed Zen Harmony Diving as a system that combines scuba diving and snorkeling with yoga, with meditation, with pranayama, which is breathing effectively, and Ayurveda, our experience of Zen Harbin Diving in combination with holistic wellness is the key to find our better health, but much more important is recreation. With recreation, it brings happiness. So we want health, we want happiness, and we want to save this world forever. And that's the legacy. We think that by adopting a new way to begin to think of the underlying problems of this world, is necessary. But let me begin by saying that the moon is 361,000 kilometers away. 50 years ago, we landed on the moon in the 69. The ocean at its deepest is 15 kilometers. We have not been to the bottom of the ocean. The ocean covers 70% of the world. 50 to 90% of the life on earth is in the ocean. And we are focused on nature, but nature, 80% of nature is the oceans. Under 10% of the space has been explored. So we don't know anything about this world. We know about the land surfaces. We know much more about the atmosphere, but we know literally nothing about the oceans. A third of the humanity's carbon dioxide is stored in the oceans. 80% of the excess heat generated ends up in the ocean. The oceans regulate climate. They regulate the weather patterns. O oceans supply 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. And it is the sink for carbon dioxide. The sink is 50 times the sink is in the oceans. We are focused on climate change on Earth but have little information on the oceans and what it will do. Because one day when the ocean strikes, I think that is a moment that we will have nowhere to run. Anders, can I come over to you? If you've ever wondered how you can marry science and spirituality, uh, we can listen to Anders now. <laughs> yes, it's a pleasure to be here in this program. Um, I like just to put up a little bit, you know, the, about the uniqueness of water, but also the uniqueness of humanity because there is some sort of interesting connection. So I hold up here a glass of ice water and everybody can see that the ice actually floats. This is very weird, it should actually sink. With all other chemical compounds on the Earth's existence, it, it will sink. All, water has almost 70 properties that is completely unusual 
and it shouldn't behave like this being on the planet Earth. So it is also our life force. We are all, as Mahendra said, all made of water. And it has to do with that water can form a lot of different connections that is so strange. The molecules bond together and it actually even can lead to that as this glass of water illustrate oil and water, we have found recently that water can even exist as two distinct different liquids. And if they will be at the same time, they will separate like this and both are H2O. So the mystery of water that behaves weird is of course related to our existence. If water would be like anything normal, we wouldn't exist. Life would never have evolved. And the uniqueness of water, as I said, is this connection, how the dams with the molecules are connecting with each other. And each molecule are equal. There is no difference between another, one molecule and another molecule, and they are constant in exchange. And from that we can also reflect, since we are water, 80% or 60 to 80% water, depending on age, um, that actually humanity is also connected through love and compassion. And if we can be inspired by the connectionness of water, we can there actually find a new way to go forward in the world by being inspired to build compassion, love, and for the future where everybody is equal, everybody is treated with respect in a gentle way, and we can thereby build a few beautiful future, including nature and all humanity. And we can thereby be inspired by water. Thank you so much, Anders. That was beautiful. Ed, actually, I'm going to come to you now. Um, Edward works in the field of energy and environment, and he essentially designs cities with low carbon footprint. You might wonder why that has anything to do with water. So I'm just going to hand over to Ed to explain. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, just a little introduction. Um, UN estimate today that 55% of people lives in urban area. And by 2050, it will reach like 60 to 70%. And those urban area needs aircon, needs heating. And those two fields are huge. Um, industry that produce lots of greenhouse emission. So how is it linked to ocean? Um, because it's industry that are uh, directly producing lots of pollution, it will have a direct impact in the fauna and the flora of the ocean that we have to preserve. So um, I am in charge of urban planning and energy fields and linked with cities. And because it's gonna go more and more into urban and dense area, uh, there's lots of new uh, development projects that are going on that brings renewable uh, energy systems with the district heatings linked to um, each, uh, each town. So basically, uh, because uh, fossil fuel today is the main reason of uh, energy production, uh, each new city needs to uh, look locally where there is resources, where there is renewable resources. And it's quite easy to find, actually. If you have a lake, if you have a river, if you have um, underground water, which is uh, quite easy to find if you drill, if you have uh, lots of um, pipes underground who gather all the, the gray uh, water, all these are source of energy that can replace fossil fuel. And you combine this energy with um, quite technical equipment like uh, heat pumps with uh, high efficiency and you can reduce uh, very fast the energy consumption, the electricity or the fossil fuel by sometimes 12. So you, with one kilowatt of electricity, you will produce 12 kilowatt of energy with renewable energy. So it's really um, one sector that today, today uh, it's between 20 to 30 percent of the greenhouse emission are produced uh, from heating. And by 2050, all the um, uh, country in development will want to have the same equivalent uh, uh, air consistent as the Western country. And it will reach to 27 percent uh, in the increase of energy. So 
therefore, uh, the city needs to have new plan, needs to have new policies in uh, renewable energy. It's already uh, since 30 years, even more under undergoing that. More and more uh, people is going to have uh, consultants, going to have engineers who are going to help them in this industry. And really, when you see the evolution of the people going more and more into urban and dense area, uh, individual cases it, it, it won't be possible anymore. You're going to have to combine this production and build uh, central connection. So, um, yes, to conclude, uh, we all know that the energy demand is going to increase. Um, but we can think better and uh, replace conventional uh, energy sources with new kinds. And there is everywhere. Uh, if I take uh, little examples, um, I'm working on now a project and uh, we're going just at 40, 50 meters underground and we take some water instead of using electricity or a fossil fuel. And this water is used for uh, air con, for your, your bath, your hot water at home, for the heating and for, um, for the, can be used also for the kitchen and all that. And instead of having one equipment individually, I just have one equipment that produces all this energy and with local sources. So each project now, each new development of small districts, big cities, anything, needs to look locally where there is energy and not to uh, bring the energy from I don't know which power plant that is at 100 kilometers away. It needs to be produced locally and with renewable energy because it's the intelligent way and it will have a direct impact in the flora and the fauna of the ocean. That's it. And yeah, I have so much to talk about it, but uh, yeah. yeah, this is a huge subject. I know this is a, a huge subject, but that's a really uh. That's a good introduction for everyone. And actually, when you think about water, you don't often think about um, the impact of our urban living having on water. So it's really, it's really an important point for everyone to understand is that uh, everyone is responsible for water, uh, whether we live in a village or we live in urban. It just so happens that most of us are living in urban environments. And actually, it, it calls for action, whether we can talk to, if, if it is possible to talk to, the consultants, the mayors of the towns, the you know, for everyone to start getting on a bandwagon to say, actually, we need to be really thinking about this. If we're going to start constructing a building, I'm talking from Dubai, where this all goes out of the window. But had Dubai been a bit smarter, it would have started, you know, 10 years ago, building in the way that Edward has just been talking about. Anyway, that's another story in another series. But um, Mahendra, I'm going to hand over to you now to, I guess, say some concrete remarks um, and some I'm, I'm hoping sorry yep Mahendra you're on yep I'm gonna hand over to you thank you so much everyone thank you and I look forward to the next session uh, thank you for moderating Deepa uh, just to finish off where I had, uh, had got up to we know very little about the oceans the oceans are actually what will decide the future of the world what I want to say is 70 million people in the world go diving. Three billion people live on the coastline of this world. We need hundreds of millions of people to go diving and report, become the social conscience of the ocean, become the public voice of the ocean to tell the world what's going on in the oceans. Because if we don't do that, it will be too late. We need policymakers to change policies to treat the ocean with respect and stop dumping everything there. We need scientists to do much more research to tell us what is going on in the ocean and what does it mean, especially for things like climate change where we have very little knowledge. So it's important that we begin to focus and increase the number of divers. How do you increase the number of divers to go diving? by telling human beings that you need to go to dive because you can learn to breathe, you can learn to meditate, and you can do gentle exercise. And those are the three things that you need to be healthy. So diving and health goes line in line with saving the oceans. And I think on this ocean day, 
we should commit to go and see the most beautiful environment under the oceans, the amazing diversity, where it contains 80% of every wealth of the world. And on that note, we need to celebrate this Earth Odyssey and this day for the World Ocean Day. So thank you very much for everybody to participate. And please make a note of earthodyssey.org. This is our website for the project that we are launching. And we are currently organizing uh, a survey from around the world with young people, the youth of today, on COVID-19 and on what impact it has had. But we will be getting back to you in two weeks for our next webinar. Thank you very much, everybody, for participating. And greetings from Bali. Yeah, please, yes, Yuri. Oh, no, just say thank you to everybody. It was, was great. Yeah, this is a very nice introduction to the problem of the oceans today. And like I said uh, in my short presentation, we have to educate ourselves, complementing what you did. Uh, educate ourselves and see how we can help, how we can personally contribute to the ocean. It doesn't say much, but what everybody does in their daily life really has an impact uh, in the ocean. So if, if you can talk to our people, our community, and let them learn the best practices on how to you know, choose the fish, uh, that's correct, that's not destroying the environment and, and not you know, use so much plastic that goes into the wa water and goes into the rivers and, and the ocean. It's, it's already a, a good start. Before we conclude, all the attendees, if they have any questions related to the water of today, please send emails to info at earthodyssey.org. If you have any questions or if you have suggestions on our next um, talks and you would like to contribute, we will be very much looking forward to your participation. So this concludes our second edition of Earth Odyssey. Thank you to all the panelists, Edward, which is my brother, Yuri, and uh, I think Ramon was there present earlier, the moderator, and of course, our superstar, uh, Anders, which was talking about uh, water. Thank you very much, Dr. Shah. Mm -hmm.